think there was never really a good chance for a two-state solution. Um, the reason is that what really matters in Palestine is the balance of power. And Israel is a strong party and the Palestinians are the weak party. And the only way you can have a two-state solution if, is if the strong party, Israel, really believes in it. And I think the Israeli governments, whether on the left or on the right, always thought that the two-state solution is a, an alternative way of how to control Palestine without necessarily occupying the whole of the country. So it was not a genuine wish to allow the Palestinians to have full sovereignty, real independence, but to do what more or less apartheid South Africa did with some of the Africans when they allowed them to create Bantustans, small monarchies that were controlled by South Africa, uh, looked independent but were not really independent. So I think the best Israel could offer the Palestinians was an autonomous uh, rule. And this is a minimum that even the most uh, moderate, flexible Palestinians could not accept. This is why I don't think there was ever a chance for a two-state solution. I also think the problem in Palestine is not a matter of borders and a political uh, uh, kind of division of power. I think the problem in Palestine and in Israel uh, in the last 100 years is the same problem. You have a movement of Jewish settlers who came in the late 19th century to Palestine, regarded Palestine as their homeland, and regarded the Palestinians as aliens, as people who are a threat. The very existence is a threat to their uh, project of building a state. And when this is the ideology, uh, you, the two-state solution cannot uh, solve uh, the problems that such an ideology creates, which dehumanizes the native Palestinians and does not allow them normal existence. And I think uh, we wasted, uh, you say, 23 years. I think it started earlier. I think we wasted 50 years of talking about the solution which is not relevant, instead of talking about decolonization, which is what we need. We need, uh, if, like in apartheid South Africa, we need the Jews in Israel to take a different moral, psychological uh, attitude towards the Palestinians, to see them as human, <coughs> first of all, as human beings, then as natives, and then as victims. And maybe then we can start having a proper peace process. Before that happens, the two-state solution is dead. Well, uh, I think it's a generational thing. I think most of the young people in the Palestinian side support the one-state solution. I think the older generation, especially those who live now in the West Bank, still in the, maybe even in Gaza Strip, still hope that the two-state solution might end Israeli military occupation and, and, and therefore there is a kind of a debate within the Palestinian society. Uh, the Jewish society does not accept the two-state solution and doesn't accept the one-state solution. The Israeli Jewish society wants the status quo to continue. So uh, we don't have allies in the Israeli Jewish community for this idea, but uh, we didn't have allies, many allies for the end of apartheid among the white community in South Africa. So I think uh, in order to understand how many Israelis would be willing to go towards a one-state solution, we need it first to be an official Palestinian position. Until it will not be an official Palestinian position, there's no reason why either Israelis or the international community would take the idea of a one democratic state seriously. The, the one democratic state initiative that started this April is an attempt to bring together all the groups, movements and individuals who, are, uh, who believe in this idea. Uh, they have different uh, ideas of how to get there and there are, ev there are even ideological uh, discussions about how the one state would look like. For example, we have people who are closer to the Islamic movements. They don't like the idea of a secular state. You have people who come from the Israeli side who still want to think about the bi-national state. 
hoping that some, some of the Jewish character uh, would be retained in a one-state solution. So what we are doing now, we are trying to bring together all these movements and to see uh, how we can build a common uh, campaign. And then the campaign is directed to the Palestinian uh, people and their representative bodies. I mean, we want to convince the Palestinians to adopt this as an official position. Because until that happens, uh, it will remain a discourse, you know, it will remain a, a nice idea, but it will not create a new reality. Well, the Jews have already lost the majority. The Jews are not the majority between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean, or in Palestine. The Jews are not the majority. So we already have an Israeli state without a majority. What we have is an Israeli state with the total control. So it's a matter of control, not of majority or minority. It's a, it's a matter whether you share power, uh, whether power is connected to your identity or to your qualification. Uh, and, and like any group in the world that has privileges and have special rights, uh, the Israeli Jews uh, don't like the idea of giving up these rights. Uh, there's also a manipulation uh, program in Israel to make you fear uh, Arabs, Palestinians, Muslims, and so on. So uh, the project of building uh, a different reality is also educational not just political, and it will take a long time to convince Israeli Jews that they uh, uh, should have a better life within a democratic state that, instead of the apartheid state that they have now. But, um, you know, we can only learn from history about this. It's, it was very difficult to convince the white people in South Africa to give up apartheid. In fact, you needed to sanction them you needed to defeat them with the liberation movement of the ANC. And even then, the vast majority of whites still believed in apartheid, even when apartheid fell. So um, I'm not surprised that the Israelis are not going to support this idea. But uh, the question is, uh, will they realize, uh, can, we, can we explain to them the price that they will pay if this continues like this? And, you know, there is the BDS movement, the Boycott Divestment Sanctions movement that send them a very clear message that their ideology and policy is not acceptable. Uh, there is the Palestinian resistance that continues. And despite the fact that a lot of Arab regimes seem to not to care about Palestine, it does not reflect what many people in the Arab world think. So with democratization in the Arab world, which is not going to happen very soon, but if democratization once again becomes a process like in 2011, I think Israel will also face a far more hostile Arab world to its policies and ideology. Yeah. Well, first of all, we have to say uh, there are different reasons why different parts of the world continue to legitimize Israel. I mean, if you analyze the American position, it has a lot to do with the Israeli lobby, with the Christian Zionist lobby, and the strategic interest of certain groups in the American society. When it comes to Europe, it's a bit more complex. It has to do with the Holocaust, it has to do with anti-Semitism, uh, has to do with Islamophobia, so there are other reasons working in, in effect. But you're right, the bottom line is that the political elites of the international community are not willing to challenge Israel. But I think this is not true about the societies. Uh, I think that there's something not democratic going on here. The political elites' views and policies and attitudes on Palestine do not reflect what most people in their societies would like them to do in Palestine. And this is not, by the way, as you know, this is not just true about Palestine. Uh, our political elites in the West do not represent much of what we want in life, economically, socially, but also morally in international relations. Uh, most of the people in Britain would not like to see the government given arms to Saudi Arabia 
to kill the children in Yemen. It doesn't matter. Britain will continue to give weapons to the Saudi regime to kill people in Yemen. So we, we have a problem of democracy in the West, and Palestine is just one of the many issues that is not represented by the political elites. I do hope that with more democratization in the West, as in, in the Arab world, the issue of Palestine will become more important to political elites and they would begin to challenge Israel. Oh, no, I think the Israeli Jewish people are very supportive of Trump. They think that uh, he, is, uh, he is their genuine supporter. Uh, they think that he will protect them from delegitimization. That America will help them against uh, uh, Iran or any other threat. So Trump is very popular in, in Israel. Um, the problem with the Israelis is that when they go to America and they try to go to the campuses, for instance, they suddenly see the BDS activists, among them many Jews. So on the one hand you have the Trump position, which is very clear, very supportive of Israel. On the other hand, you have the civil society in the United States that compared to 20 years ago is very pro-Palestinian. Uh, and uh, this is where the question of what I talked about before comes into play here. Again, is, this, is the Trump position, when we say the American position, are we talking about the society's position or are we talking about the president's position? Uh, the Israeli lobby in America has made sure in the last 70 years, not 70 years, it was only established in 62, so less, but the American lobby in Israel, uh, the Israeli lobby, I'm sorry, in America, is making sure that politicians, regardless of the public opinion, would continue to support Israel unconditionally. I'm not sure that they are succeeding anymore, uh, despite the fact that we had Trump. We have to remember who was the standing, uh, one of the persons who was, could have been possibly running against Trump was Bernie Sanders, if Hillary Clinton would not, probably had rigged the elections against him. Bernie Sanders had a very different agenda on Palestine than, than Trump. Uh, the same is true about Britain. Jeremy Corbyn has a very different agenda on Palestine than the present British government. So we're beginning to see, you know, powerful politicians with very strong commitment to Palestine. They are not yet in power, but they are not far from that. And maybe this is a good sign for things to come. I, I think, to be fair to Trump, we should say uh, his policies are not that different from his predecessors. Uh, America was never an honest broker in the, in the question of Palestine. I think he's just more honest. He just he doesn't play a double game. So what uh, the most important thing he will do is he would end the American uh, involvement in the peace process, which is good. I think it's a good thing. I think it will wake up Palestinians who believed that uh, America would deliver uh, a just solution based on the two states. I think these Palestinians are now waking up and they realize that they cannot trust the United States. America will no longer be able to provide any kind of assistance in order to end the Israeli oppression. What will they do with this realization? I have no idea. But uh, I think Trump, in many ways, ended the uh, Pax Americana. Uh, the danger is that he, dealt, he, he did it through Jerusalem, which is very symbolic, very charged topic. Mm -hmm in the Muslim world, not just in the Arab world. So you, you, we, we cannot predict, and I'm not going to, because I don't know, uh, but this could really mean that people will not always take rational uh, decisions uh, after the 15th of May and could easily deteriorate into a very unpleasant scenario. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the Israeli pretense for being the only democracy in the Middle East should be tested uh, by two very important uh, groups that 
tell you whether a society is willing really to be open or not. And the two watchdogs in many ways are the media and academia. And both these uh, groups, both the media in Israel and the academia, uh, uh, are regarded in the West as being democratic, being part of the civilized world. But if you examine their behavior, you can see that they are totally loyal to the Zionist ideology. And they never question the fundamentals of the ideology. And therefore, I think they are complicit in the crimes of the Israeli state against the Palestinians. And um, I, I, it's an important uh, issue because uh, if I'm right, and also the academia and the media cannot be trusted to um, challenge the ideology that uh, created the Nakba and also the Palestinian suffering since 1948. If I'm right, then I'm, I'm also right that the model that we need in the case of Israel is not a peace process, but the model of South Africa. That you need the model of sanctions and you need the model of decolonization. So I think that's why it's so important to look what the Israeli academia does and to expose its uh, attempt to be both democratic and Zionist at the same time, which is impossible. Yeah, I, I think that uh, what the people who, who are important in the international community should realize is that uh, we have an issue not just in Israel and Palestine, we have an issue in the Arab world now of human rights and civil rights. We have regimes that violate human rights and civil rights. We have opposition, resistant groups that violate human rights and civil rights. And uh, this is, has brought horrific consequences to the Middle East in the last, since the American invasion of Iraq. Now, in order to get out of this situation, you need international engagement. Uh, the Arab world by itself will not be able to stop the bloodshed. Now, in order for an international intervention to be effective, it cannot uh, uh, treat Israel as an exceptional case. If you are worried about the human rights abuses by Bashar Assad, you should be worried at the same level of the Israeli abuses of human rights in Gaza. And I think that's what I would like the international community to do, is to include the Israeli violation in the general discussion about human rights and civil rights in the Middle East. If they're not going to do it, A, the Palestinians will continue to suffer, and B, the international community would find it very difficult to bring an end to a horrific situation that also causes the refugee problem and the movement of people to Europe. So there's so many ripple effects that uh, could be prevented uh, if we can discuss properly the issue there. Mm -hmm.